Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. I'm Mary Maté. Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us. It's a terrible time in the world, which means it's a great time to listen to a podcast like ours so we can tell you all about it. There's so much to cover. And as always, to support the show uh, and keep it going and get bonus content, go to our website, usefulidiotspodcast.com. Indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And uh, in in terms of uh, pop culture updates, I just want to say that I am one of the Jewish creatives who signed a letter in support of Jonathan Glazer, the director of Zone of Interest, that great movie about the Holocaust that, uh, of course, won Best Foreign Picture at the Academy Awards. And then he was condemned and his words were misrepresented by Zionists. Uh, and then a bunch of uh, Jewish creatives, as they were called, the most famous of whom, sadly, was Deborah Messing, signed a letter accusing him of false equivalency, of uh, equating the Holocaust with what's happening in Gaza, which he actually didn't do in his acceptance speech. He just condemned the hijacking of uh, Jewish identity for uh, by an occupation. And then a bunch of actually talented Jewish creatives, present company excluded, of course, but people like Joel Cohen, um, Elliot Gould, David Cross, Ilana Glazer, Wallace Shawn, actually talented people, Deborah Winger uh, signed a letter supporting Jonathan Glazer. So that's your double update because it was signed. It totally dominates the other side who suck and condemned him. And I'm one of the signatories. I made it onto the list. I'll go a little under the hood here. You know, I got asked oh. to sign that too, but um, do I consider myself a Jewish creative? Uh, I do have an IMDb page because uh, I've been there an extra. So I've, I've been an extra and like I had a bit part in a friend of mine's uh, uh, short film once. So I do actually do have an IMDb page and I did uh, try Aaron... stand up once. So I do consider myself to be somewhat of a Jewish creative. But then I was thinking, you know, I also like the problem like with these petitions is you don't want to spread it too thin. Like you don't want to dilute the message. Right. So I hesitated as to whether or not to sign um, because I felt like I was kind of stretching the definition of a, what a Jewish creative is. But but I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that you made it. That's well, that's awesome. Aaron, you're leaving out one of your biggest credits, creatively speaking, which was when you starred in a commercial. That's true. As a child. <laughs> That's true. Yes, I forgot about that. You were a child yeah. Jewish creative. That's true. Maybe maybe I should uh I shouldn't sell myself so short. You know, one time I was looking at I was looking for an apartment and um the broker was trying to really sell me on the place. I didn't end up taking it in part because there was like a really ugly piece of art in the lobby and I didn't want to have to every single day go into, you know, like pass it as I was going home. This horrific piece of art. But anyway, uh, he said to me, you know, he asked me like what I did. And I said, I'm a journalist. And he goes, just immediately, he goes, you know what? I have a lot of respect for writers. And I said that was such a funny line because like yeah. who has respect for writers anymore? But true. with this with this letter, I have a lot of respect for creatives. I have, I have a lot of respect for Jewish creatives. And I yeah. I didn't want to dilute the meaning, the power of this list by by adding my own. But but maybe I should. You should have put as your credit, like Aaron uh, Mate, col uh, hi, uh, comma, what was the commercial for? War Games? Well, my, my very first one, I, I did several. I have several to my to my name. But my very first one, uh, it was a toy called The Men of Metal. And basically, you, you little figurines in a metal you put on your, on your chest and you take them out and you fight. And, they, you know, um, that was my very first credit. What, what other products did you uh, did you act for? Well, this is the late 80s, early 90s. So I also did a Robocop toy and I did a Ghostbusters commercial as well. Wow. Those are the ones I remember. Uh, I mean, what about Aaron Mate, comma, Robocop? Think anyone's going to doubt your creative bona fides? Yeah, sure. That? I, 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 guess I, was, I guess I was part of the Robocop franchise. Uh, if you take an expansion. I didn't think of it that way. Yes. Yeah. So All right. reconsider. Maybe you can uh, join your, add your name. Fair enough. Fair enough. And that's been your pop culture update. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of wonderful things, let's turn to our four basic food groups. And what do we have for Democrat Suck? Okay. So for Democrat Suck, let's take a look at uh, State Department spokesman Matthew Miller, who has some really interesting things to say about the attack that Israel launched on 
uh, an Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, because people uh, are often presenting the Iranian attack as kind of out of nowhere. Um, something that's important to know is that in addition to killing Iranian scientists, uh, Israel had recently killed seven people, including two uh, Iranian uh, members of the IRG at the Iranian consulate in Damascus. And here's Matthew Miller being asked by the fearless Matt Lee of the AP, who is consistently uh, speaking truth to power during these press conferences. Let's hear what he has to say about what Israel did to Iran. Have you guys decided yet or made a determination about whether what Israel hit in Damascus was a diplomatic we, facility we, or not? We have not. We have not. So how long is this going to take? I can't answer that question. We're look, continuing to look into it. Um, I don't have a timetable, well, what, but it's what something more that we're... What do you need to... Uh, uh, we need to, to gather enough information that will allow us to make an actual determination. You, got, you have no one on the ground in Syria. We have arranged... Overtly, uh, as I said to you when uh, the last time you engaged with me on this question, we have an, uh, a range of abilities, a range of ways to gather information. They're partner countries of ours who yeah. are on the ground. We have intelligence capabilities, off, uh, obviously, um, and we're continuing to gather information, but we've not yet been able to yeah, make determination. I, 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 I get it, but you were pretty quick into, you know, condemning the, uh, you know, the invasion of the Mexican embassy in, uh, in, in, in Ecuador. That was a very clear, well-established embassy. And this is not very clear uh, where they the, blew up. The, this is something that is taking a little bit more time. No one to, died to in that incident. Uh, but that's not the question. The question was, what is it? Is it was it an embassy or a consulate or not? And it was very yeah. clear. How in, in the, hard very is clear to figure that out? In the case of the Mexican, it's something that we're gathering information it's been on. Like two weeks, uh, and we continue More. to gather information. We don't have a determination. Yet. Somehow, the United States State Department is unable to figure out whether a consulate is actually a consulate. I don't know if this is some kind of philosophical, like French. Um, sometimes, a, you know, this is not a pipe, this is not a consulate type of thing. Uh, I'm not sure what the challenge is here, but uh, Israel, of course, has finally, by the way, admitted that they struck the consulate. At first, they denied it, which is the, you know, the classic Israeli move, deny and lie, then admit by the time it's kind of out of the news cycle. But um, it's kind of a creative way for the United States to avoid condemning Israel for flagrantly breaking international law. What I think the argument will be here is that Israel and the U.S. will say, well, because there were these uh, Iranian operatives, uh, intelligence officials and military officials like the general who was killed inside, then it loses its diplomatic status. The problem with that is if you look at what the CIA does, for example, around the world, is they'll always deploy agents to their embassies, to U.S. embassies. Right. So in every or in many U.S. embassies, you have CIA operatives working under diplomatic cover. So if the U.S. and Israel really want to go there, then they're basically saying that every U.S. embassy, which has a CIA operative, is fair game for attack, which, of course, nobody wants to see happen. So that's the kind of twisted logic that the U.S. has to deploy to violate international law, like bombing a right. consulate, which is supposed to be off limits. It's actually supposed to be sovereign Iranian territory. So this right. really is a direct attack on Iran. Yeah, but imagine that. The U.S., uh having double a double standard. Shocking. <laughs> you heard it here first. Well, let's take a look at another Matthew Miller clip. This time he's being asked about uh, the lack of condemnation of Israel's attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria. Let's hear what he has to say. The uh, Iranian mission at the UN said that basically if the US or the Security Council rather condemned uh, the attack on the consulate in Damascus, this could have, uh, any uh, retaliation could have been avoided. So is this your understanding that actually you don't condemn it because you cannot verify whether it is a diplomatic mission or not? And also, do you think that Israel can go and attack any other diplomatic mission if this is proved to be actually a diplomatic mission and you don't expect them, any country to retaliate? So uh, a, 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 a few a few things just in, in order. First of all, I think that's a pretty flimsy excuse from the Iranian government. If they don't want to widen this conflict and they don't want to attack Israel, they don't need permission from anyone else, either at the United Nations or they just have to make the decision not to do that. And that's the decision that they should make. Interesting. So he's saying Iran should make the decision not to retaliate. Do you think he's going to tell Israel to uh, that they should make the decision not to retaliate? 
No, in fact, uh, the Biden administration's line is that Israel will do what it chooses. Right, because it's a sovereign nation. Basically, if Iran retaliates, and by the way, it doesn't kill anybody. Nobody right. was killed in Iran's response. That's important response. to note, right. That's a flagrant violation of international law, of all norms. If Israel starts the whole thing by, I mean, and this is the, late, this is the latest Israeli strike on Iranian interests. It's not the first time they've done this, but... The, if they, you know, in this round at least, they started it by bombing a consulate in Damascus. Uh, that's okay, killing, killing um, seven people. Yeah, and in fact, Iran even said, Iran said, and you know, who knows if this is true because it's over now. It's a counterfactual, but they said that had the U.S. not blocked a U.N. Security Council condemnation of Israel, right. then maybe Iran wouldn't have acted. And yeah. we'll never know because that's exactly what the U.S. did: is, is they blocked a U.N. measure. Right. And therefore, Iran claims they had little choice but to respond militarily. Right. But that was and that was the premise of her question. Yeah. That journalist question. Yeah. Really unbelievable. So that's my Democrat suck for you. What do we got for Republican suck? For Republican suck, you remember all that talk about America first, MAGA, you know, Republicans were gonna stand up to the deep state and stop oh, yeah. this horrible proxy war in Ukraine that continues to get worse. Well, never mind that. House Speaker Mike Johnson has been under a lot of pressure to finally stop blocking this vote to prolong the Ukraine proxy war and give, by the way, Israel billions of more dollars to murder Palestinians. And he went down to Mar-a-Lago over the weekend, got the blessing from Donald Trump to, yes, pass that Ukraine measure. While meanwhile, the entire establishment media and Democrats have been pretending that Donald Trump is the one standing in the way of more funding for the war. When really, if you look at it, it's the polls, I think, that have been the biggest obstacle because polls, especially of Republican voters, show that most people do not want to pour more money into this war. But never mind all that, because Mike Johnson has caved. There's going to be a vote, he says, on funding the Ukraine proxy war and and Israel. And this is how he justified it to himself and the world. We need steady hands at the wheel. I, look, I regard myself as a as a wartime speaker. I mean, in a literal sense, we are. I knew that when I took the gavel. I didn't anticipate that this would be an easy path. Former Speaker Newt Gingrich posted a couple days ago on his social media that um, this is the hardest challenge that's faced a speaker probably in the history of the country, in the moment we're in right now. He said, arguably, uh, maybe comparable to the Civil War, but maybe worse. Okay, so basically, according to Speaker Johnson, he's a wartime speaker, and that's why he has to cave. And contrary to what his voters want, and contrary to what I think reality calls for, which is diplomacy, uh, in all on all fronts, with Russia and also with Hamas to release the hostages and end Israel's assault, Mike Johnson's saying we're going to fund all these wars. And I don't recall the U.S. declaring war formally on Russia. I don't recall the U.S. formally declaring war on Hamas. But yet, Mike Johnson says I'm a wartime speaker, and therefore more money has to go into all these wars. Well, he is a WTS, Aaron. You don't understand because you're not a WTS. A wartime speaker. Yeah. 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 He also, meanwhile, has caved on uh, FISA, where basically he wants to authorize more warrantless surveillance. He previously voiced criticism of that. But again, since becoming speaker, he's caved. And I guess that's what happens in Washington. Once you get a position of actual influence and power, the real power in Washington, which is the national security state, just wields its leverage and anybody wants to stick around has no choice but to cave. I mean, we, we keep seeing that over and over and over. Similar with both Barack Obama and Donald Trump. Neither of them actually really wanted to expand the proxy war in Ukraine, but they were forced to by their hawkish aides and the entrenched bureaucracy. And Mike Johnson's carrying on in that tradition. Mazel tov, Mike. <laughs> well, um, uh Let's shift gears a little bit and go to Isn't That Weird? This is one of those Isn't That Weirds that could easily have been and isn't that terrible. Uh, this story comes out of Brazil. And what we're seeing here is it's kind of a weekend at Bernie's story where a woman wheeled in her deceased uncle to get a to have him sign a bank loan. Let's take a look. He's blurred out respectfully. <laughs> So for people who are just listening, this is a woman who has uh, is is telling her her uncle in Portuguese to sign the document 
showing him how to do it. She's holding his head up. Uh, this is a New York Post video. It says, in the scene like something out of Weekend at Bernie's, a Brazilian woman wheeled the corpse of an elderly man into a bank to try to get him to co-sign on a loan. She asked her uncle to sign financial documents that would allow her to take out a $3,400 loan. I mean, I kind of think this is a victimless crime. She's not hurting anyone. I'm not sure it'll 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 uh, pass legal muster, but I'm I'm okay with it morally speaking. Yeah, the uh, socialist in me says that the crime here is capitalism that forces people into these yes. desperate situations to right. try to come up with ways to make money. It's uh, it's it's sad that it's a. I mean, there's obviously some levity in that story. The the callback to weekend at Bernie's, at Bernie's yeah. But uh, it's also very sad. It is, yeah. But uh, I'm sure she'd rather not have to do that. So I agree with you. The uh, the crime is capitalism, not the corpse wheeling. The crime is capitalism. By the way, everyone, sign up to support Youthful Idiots for uh, $6 a month. Yeah. Because we hate capitalism. Okay. We hate capitalism, yeah. Um, and that was just a great PSA against capitalism that we showed you with that with that uh, <laughs> that video right there. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, for Isn't That Terrible, let's turn to a reliable source of terribles, a guy named Tom Cotton. He happens to mm. serve in the U.S. Senate, but... His main vocation is advocating for war and slandering anybody who dares oppose it. So here he is responding to a sit-in that was held uh, in San Francisco on the Golden Gate Bridge with people, you know, as they've done many times throughout this Gaza genocide, blocking the road, blocking cars. So Tom Cotton initially said this, I encourage people who get stuck behind the pro-Hamas mobs blocking traffic Take matters into your own hands. It's time to put an end to this nonsense. Now, after a little backlash, he edited his tweet to say this. Take matters into your own hands to get them out of the way. Okay, so he realized that it's not a good look to call for mob violence. So he's right. just saying, take matters into your hands, not to you know hurt or kill anybody, but just to get them out of your way so you can keep driving. But uh, doesn't getting them out of the way include the risk of hurting them? It certainly does, but uh, that nuance is, does not really matter to uh, Tom Cotton, who, right. who just ultimately does want violence. And then he went on Fox News and doubled down. I agree with you that you have to get to these pro or these uh, criminals early. If something like this happened in Arkansas on a bridge there, let's just say I think there'd be a lot of very wet criminals that have been tossed overboard, not by law enforcement, but by the people whose uh, road they're blocking. If they glued their hands to a car or a the pavement, well, probably pretty painful to have their skin ripped off. But I think that's what, the way we'd handle in Arkansas. And I would encourage most people anywhere that get stuck behind criminals like this uh, who are trying to block traffic to take matters in their own hands. There's only usually a few of them, and there's a lot of people being inconvenienced. It's time to put an end to this nonsense. Oh, my God. Yeah, so he wants to have anti-genocide protesters' skin ripped off. Yeah. Uh, that's Tom Cotton for you, everybody. I like the way um, he started off by calling them protesters, then he realized uh, he had to make them sound more nefarious than they actually are and call them criminals. Yeah, and he also loves to call them pro-Hamas. Right. Uh, because in his mind, if you oppose mass murder, then you're pro-Hamas. That's how he views the world. And he's a member of the Senate. And uh, yeah, um, what, what can you say? But uh you know, he's not that different. He He's not really an exception inside Congress. I mean, that really is the dominant view. The amount of people who actually believe that you can oppose mass murder and not be pro-Hamas inside the con inside Congress is a very small minority. I guess Tom Cotton stands out in that he openly advocates violence against them. Right. We should give him credit for that. That makes him somewhat unique. Yeah. I mean, in Congress, most people advocate violence against Palestinians. You know, we've seen right, so many right. of all these politicians saying, you know, wipe them out, kill them all. Tom Turn Cotton, into a parking has, lot. Yeah, Tom Cotton believes that. But also anybody here who doesn't want to see Palestinians exterminated, let's rip their skin off. Right. He's more of an internationalist, an <laughs> intersectionalist. He doesn't stop at the border. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> and those have been your four basic food groups. For this week's guest, we are joined by Assad Abu Khalil. He is a Lebanese-American professor of political science at California State University. And we are going to speak to him about the latest in the Gaza genocide and Israel's decision to escalate this horrible calamity 
by bombing the Iranian consulate in Damascus and the ensuing fallout. So let's go to Professor Assad Abu Khalil. Professor Assad Abu Khalil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I want to start with uh, asking you to respond to this headline from the New York Times. This just came out as we're recording this. <laughs> It says this, miscalculation led to escalation and clash between Israel and Iran. Israeli officials say they didn't see a strike on a high-level Iranian target in Syria as a provocation. So somehow, according to Israel, when they bombed a foreign consulate in Damascus, which is sovereign Iranian territory, killing seven people, they didn't see it as a provocation. What do you think is, is going on here? Well, I think somebody can write, uh, several people can write dissertations and theses about headlines of the New York Times during the Israeli-Gaza war. I mean, there is such an extra effort being exerted by the New York Times, the Washington Post, to cover up the crimes of Israel uh, in Gaza. But I think we should also point out that all this is part of the concerted effort of government. I've never seen governments and media in the West, the entire Western genocidal coalition, being in sync. They are all singing to the same tune, which is support justification for the war. And I think what this headline uh, doesn't show is that the extent to which Israel always miscalculates, always makes wrong assumptions, and to the detriment of the civilian population of people of the region. I mean, they thought that they can bomb an Iranian embassy and not suffer any consequences. This is the arrogance of power. They also thought that they can occupy the Palestinian people since 1948 without suffering consequences. More than that, Israel is such a colonizing racist uh, occupier that they assume that after all these decades of subjugation and killing of Palestinians, that the Palestinians will eventually enjoy the occupation. I mean, I've seen Zionists even putting pictures of Gaza beaches before October 7, as if the people there were having a vacation not pointing out that Palestinians have been killed in Gaza and the West Bank and elsewhere by Israel nonstop uninterruptedly from 1948 and even 1930s until today. So what the New York Times headlines show is that they had another headline where they said, is it illegal to bomb somebody's embassy? I mean, could you imagine if this was an Israeli embassy or a Western embassy? There would be no question about it. But when they plant these questions, they make it debatable. They make any crime by Israel is subject to debate, even when there is such a clear evidence. This is similar to Human Rights Watch, by the way. Human Rights Watch, if it's covering Russia or any enemy of the United States, it is always evidence of war crime. When it comes to Israel, it is always apparent war crime. Apparent war crime. They always add that word. And uh, what did you make of Iran's retaliation? The you know standard narrative here in the West is that Iran overreacted. It launched hundreds of missiles and drones, and it was only the uh, expert defense of the U.S. and its allies, uh, along with Israel, that managed to avoid a complete disaster and, and the killing of thousands of civilians inside Israel. No, I think the Israeli response, I mean, the Iranian response or retaliation to the unprovoked attack on the embassy in Damascus shows that people fight wars differently. Iran showed that you can fight a war without targeting civilians, something Israel doesn't want to do at all in its history. The Iranians were deliberately, and they announced that, they only targeted civilian sites inside uh, occupied Palestine. What is significant about it is there is no question it's great humiliation uh, for Israel. I mean, more than 300 drones and missiles, but they were not loaded with explosives. They were sending a message. Not all of them were loaded with explosives. They were sending a message that we can reach you from our lands in Iran, something they have said before. If you attack us, we'll fight back from our land. We have missiles that can target you. The other thing that it shows is the extent to which Israel and America lies about military matters. They are such blatant liars. Do you know that in 1991, when there were Scud missiles by Saddam that were fired on Israel and Saudi Arabia, General Schwarzkopf said at the time, February of 1991, 100% of Scud missiles were intercepted. He didn't say 99 which is the one that's used by Israel, 100%. Within a few years, the government accounting office did a study, and they showed 9% were intercepted. Just look at the gap in the lie. And of course, there's a famous professor at MIT who did this study and said 
it is likely that zero Scud missiles were intercepted by the Patriot missiles. Remember when George Herbert Walker Bush went to the factory which produces the Patriot missiles to show how good the defense industry is. Similar thing happened with the attack on the Iran, uh, U.S. military base after the murder of Qasem Soleimani. At the time, the U.S. government said there were no injuries among the Israelis, the American soldiers. Within a few months, they said eight, uh, 40 casualties. Then they said 60. Then they said eight, the number is now 80-something, I think. So it shows you the extent. So when I heard the figure of 99% deception, I knew there was a lie. Today, it is reported by some Israeli media, it is 84%. But most importantly, even they cannot reconcile their own lies. They said 99% interception, but they admitted that eight missiles fell on two air bases. Look how targeted these attacks are, Aaron and Kate, that they made an effort to only go after a military site. And these, these two air bases are the ones from which the fighter jets took off in order to bomb the Iran embassy in Damascus. So eight missiles by the admission of Israel fell. So if you just say eight missiles fell, went through, so it means 99% is a lie. So this is part of the lie of Israel does all the time about how the number of casualties, the number of Hamas people they killed. I mean, uh, it, the, Israel is somebody who cannot be believed even when they tell the truth because they lie so much. I'm quoting from the Babylonian Talmud, as you know. How do you think the world has perceived um, Israel's strike on Iran and then Iranians' uh, strike on uh, Israel? Right. Uh, it's interesting when we speak about the world, because I was looking at a speech that uh, Biden, yesterday, my international relations class, uh, Biden gave a speech when he visited Ukraine one time, and he said, the world stands behind you and behind NATO, the world. And the New York Times one time was talking about Joe Biden's position on Ukraine, and they said, the world is united behind Biden. And I was telling the class, when they say the world, they mean the white Western world. That's what they mean. So it is certainly not the world. It is the Western NATO coalition that is, uh, you know, taking this position. I mean, their response is very typical of what David Cameron said on live TV, which is that if one of their embassies attacked, it's a horrific violation of the Vienna Protocol of international law and Geneva Convention. But when Israel or NATO countries do it, of course, it's something that's acceptable and justifiable. I mean. I don't think that Israel can cross any threshold for Western nations. There's no threshold. I mean, I have no doubt if Israel were to drop a nuclear bomb on Gaza tomorrow, there will be very few dissenters in the U.S. Congress. I don't think that Bernie Sanders would dissent even, would find justification. Very few will dissent on that subject. And this is one thing that I want to point out to the audience, which is the world, the other part of the world, Africa and the Middle East, they had been watching. And one of the great benefits to me about what's been happening is that the West is seen for what it really is, a racist, colonialist West that stands for war crimes and has been since the Second World War, at least since the Second World War. And that if we were to apply the Nuremberg standards on Western coalition since the Second World War, even during the Cold War, they will all be behind bars. It's that what General LeMay said to McNamara during the Second World War when they were planning plot by plot, the incineration of Tokyo in the bombing. He said to McNamara by his admission in the documentary, Fog of War, if we are going to lose this war, we're going to wind up on trial for war crime. And the same applies today what's happening in Gaza. The U.S. is a full participant. They participated in the defense and the offense. They sent their military into Gaza. But So what I'm saying is that the West is seen by the world for it is racist, double standards, and blatant about it. And the other one is the bankruptcy of the left, of the Western left. I mean, we are seeing that. We saw Bernie Sanders. Who can ever take seriously? Not me, certainly. I've never taken him seriously because I, I judge him by his voting record. His voting record from the 1980s when he was first in the House and in the Senate has been atrocious. He never met an Israeli war that he did not support. He never met an Israeli war for which he did not blame the enemies of Israel. That's his record. All the enemies of Israel are terrorists by him. Whether they were communists in the 1980s, or the Islamist Hezbollah and Hamas today. But it is good to see the left where they are, whether it's uh, Luxembourg, this uh, you know wrongly named institute, which does a lot of sinister work in the Middle East, just like the Soros Foundation. The Rosa Luxembourg Institute in the Middle East, or the Green Party in Germany. You know how the Green Party responded to the Israeli attack, uh, to the Iranian retaliation? 
not only they were part of the course in Germany, uh, which called for additional military aid to Israel, but the Green Party was alone, not the fascist. The Green Party said that we need to respond to the attack by closing down the Islamic Center in Hamburg. I really believe Western countries are moving, inching forward towards a day when they can easily ban Islam. I mean, I can see it being happening on college campuses today because this newly revised definition of anti-Semitism has no end. I mean, I think it's, I mean, if the slogan from the river to the sea is going to be anti-Semitic, why not Islam? I mean, why not religious quotations that Muslim students cite on college campuses? Because that can be deemed offensive to uh, pro-Israeli students on college campuses. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned if uh, Israel dropped a nuclear bomb on Gaza, you think that a lot of people would defend it. And I've heard people say this isn't genocide what Israel's doing, because if they wanted to, they could kill everyone in Gaza. They exactly. could drop a nuclear bomb. And because they're not doing that, it's not genocide. <laughs> it's not the definition of genocide, but... Uh, they did that in 1982 when I was uh, when I barely survived the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, which resulted in a few months in the murder of 20,000 civilians, uh, uh, mostly civilians, Lebanese and Palestinians and Syrians. And at that time, if you remember, leftist Tom Hayden, I never can forget these things. I was still in Beirut. Tom Hayden and Jane Fonda, those leftists, went to an Israeli warship that was bombing the hell out of Lebanon. And they were entertaining Israeli troops as they were bombing us. So this is the left for me. I never had any illusions about the Western left. But I think what is illustrative for many people in the developing countries is to see the left for what they are. The left in America, the left of Europe, uh, the Soros Foundation. Look at Soros, for example. He's always tweeting about various parts of the world, often about enemies of the United States. Gaza does not figure at all. And he's engaged in funding of so many media in the, in the Middle East and so on, along with NATO countries and so on. Can you share a little bit about your experience in Lebanon? Because I think a lot of people, younger people, don't know about that chapter of Israeli aggression. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was born in Lebanon in 1960. And at the time, there was no Hezbollah, there was no Hamas, there was no PLO. And at that time, Israel was constantly, regularly violating Lebanese earth space and territory. They were constantly coming in, kidnapping uh, shepherds and civilians, and then returning them sometimes, sometimes murdering them. And they also shot, in 1950, they shot a Lebanese civilian airliner. They shot a Syrian uh, airliner. I mean, when we talk about hijacking in the Middle East, every crime of terrorism in our region has been pioneered, started by the Israelis, and even before Israel, by the Zionists, you name it. Throwing bombs in buses, uh, throwing bombs in crowded markets, uh, letter bombs against British embassies, booby-trapped cars, battle bombs, you know, they, they made sound that battle bombs were never introduced in the Middle East until the Syrian war. In reality, they were introduced in the incineration of the people and neighborhood of uh, Jaffa in order to create the greater Tel Aviv region. I mean, there's a book about what they did, the war crimes that allowed uh, Tel Aviv to, to rise as this wonderful metropolis that Western people like so much. And so when I was growing up, I always had this encounter with Israeli terrorism in our land. My grandfather's house and my uh, you know, immediate uh, extended family were living there. So we're constantly going to Tyre. And almost every time we visited, on the way back, Israel was bombing along the way. And by the mid late 60s, it was horror because they were bombing, invading almost on a weekly basis. And as I said back, I mean, Israel always has a justification for why they hate those enemies. They hated Hamas and Hezbollah because religious fanatic. They hated the PFLP because they were communist tied to the Soviet Union. They hated Fatah organization because they were Arab nationalists and secular, but they also had a sinister agenda uh, that mimicked uh, the Nazi uh, government. I mean, and they always did that. Liberals of Israel, people like Amos Oz, pioneered this conflation of the Palestinian national movement with the Nazi regime. And they used that picture of Haj Amin Husseini in order to basically say, whatever we do against the Palestinian is justifiable because whatever Western power did against Nazi Germany was justifiable, including what they did in Dresden and other places, the targeting of civilian areas. And the Israeli government invoked that very blatantly during this war. They said, look what the West did in Dresden and Tokyo and so on to justify their murder. And of course, the West was nodding in agreement, certainly in the US Congress. So when I was growing up, I was witnessing firsthand what Israel uh, does to Lebanon. 
I mean, one of the most horrific events of my life, and I've witnessed civil war, the civil war, uh, you know, broke out in 1975, I was 15 years old, and I've seen a lot of horrors, I've seen dead bodies, and so on, and I've heard a lot of bombing, and so on, but nothing compared to what happened when the Israeli invasion started in June of 1982. I was in the living room of our house, we people live in an apartment building over there, as you know, and we heard Israeli fighter jets, you know, hovering over, and we heard, we hear them all the time, they bomb, but the bombs were getting closer at the time. My mom was getting nervous and I was cracking jokes saying, you know, they probably bombed, you know, this place or that place. And then suddenly we heard the loudest explosion of my entire life. And I'm somebody who grew up around civil war and we didn't know what happened, but imagine I went through several seconds wondering if I am alive and dead. The only time it happened to me in my life because for a second, all the glass in the house were shattered, the loudest explosion there is, and then, like there is a window here and there's a window behind me. If imagine a thick, like science fiction movies, like visual effects, a thick ray of fire and dust traveling with flames from one end of the place. So my mom was on the floor, she fainted immediately. And for several seconds, I remember thinking, am I alive or dead? Uh, that's the experience uh, you know, that I had. I mean, Israel incinerated Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. In the mid 1970s, there was a refugee camp called Nabati. None of you, have, you follow Middle East politics closely, but you've never heard of the camp, right? Uh, it never registered because it doesn't exist anymore. Israel one time sent fighter jets, set the entire camp ablaze. They just didn't want it to exist. And of course they used their surrogate militias, the Falange and the Harar party and others, in order to go after the Dubai refugee camp, predominantly Christian, the Tal Zata, Jisr al-Basha, uh, Sobra and Shatila you've heard of, and Nahr al barid All these camps were subject to Israeli cruel bombardment. They never distinguished between Lebanese and Palestinian. They never distinguished between military and civilian target. That's our record of Israel. What is happening in the Gaza war is not that it is new, but the scale is higher because Israel is really out of control. They are freaking out. They know that their enemy is formidable. It's not like the PLO days. The PLO days, they didn't take the leaders seriously and for good reasons. Yes, Arafat and his cronies were weak, were not fierce, were uh, subject to compromises all the time and pressures by the US government. This is a leader of a national movement, Yes, Arafat, who read the text of a statement that was faxed to him by the State Department. I mean, you cannot take that man seriously at all. Uh, now they are dealing with people like Hassan Nasrallah, Sinwar. And what is different is that they are fierce and they know how to fight against occupation. And that's what Israel is freaking out. They want to scare the Arabs, but the Arabs are not scared. Just the other day, this is not in the American TV news, the elite Golani Brigade sent few soldier, uh, officers into Lebanese territory. Upon arriving, within few minutes of their arrival, they were met with a uh, landmine set up by Hezbollah and they were injured, they were taken back into occupied Palestine. They have been bombing Lebanon nonstop since October, by the way, which doesn't register much here in the United States. So what is amazing to me in the West is that you always, uh, not you, of course, the West always find reasons to demonize those who fight Israel. So no matter who you are, you can be secular, feminist, Islamist, atheist, no matter who you are, you will be demonized. I mean, they did that with Nasser. They did that with Arafat. They did that with Sadat before he kneeled down. And what is interesting today about when we speak this alleged fight of anti-Semitism, because I never thought that the Zionist movement was sincere ever in fighting anti-Semitism because they had no qualms about making alliances with the most notorious anti-Semites of my Arab world, I know for a fact. The Saudi government has produced more anti-Semitism since the end of Nazi Germany than any power in the world in multiple languages. They translated the protocols, they translated Henry Ford's memoirs, and they sent them to different countries in large volumes. And yet, United States and Israel have no problem with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. Another example, Anwar Sadat. Anwar Sadat is an unabashed, uh, un, uh, somebody who never had regrets about his Nazi anti-Semitic leanings. And he has speeches when he was head of the Islamic Congress, the Secretary General, of producing, uh, you know, grotesque speeches, demonizing Jewish people. Mahmoud Abbas, he is now treated as the answer to Hamas 
The guy that the NATO, I just read the, today in some paper, that they are now have a plan for Gaza whereby NATO forces, along with Saudi Arabia and UAE, as if they are popular among the Palestinians, they're going to set up a regime headed by Mahmoud Abbas. I mean, they keep him alive for several years more. This is a guy who is a Holocaust denier. His so-called PhD dissertation contains published in Arabic. I mean, I know that he submitted his... I heard it from the founder of the Institute of Pal uh, Palestine Studies. Uh, I met him recently at Cambridge, uh, in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, uh, Professor Wade Khalidi. He told me when uh, Mahmoud Abbas finished his PhD dissertation in Moscow, he sent it to the Institute of Palestine Studies. And it was so anti-Semitic, Walid Khalid told me he would not touch it. And he sent it back, said, this is unpublishable because Palestinian intellectuals like Khalidi and others, Edward Said and Sharab, you know, they were very keen in distinguishing between hostility to Zionism and hostility to Judaism, which has always been frowned upon by the intellectual elite of the Arab world. The ones who peddled anti-Semitism were the friends of the United States. These Gulf governments, Anwar Sadat, the Moroccan king, these kind of people. Going back to some more current news, uh, this just appeared in the Times of Israel, where you had Biden previously saying that the U.S. opposes an Israeli invasion of Rafah. But now we get this he headline saying this, U.S. agreed to Israel's plan for Rafah in return for not carrying out large Iran strikes. So the claim here from the Times of Israel is that the U.S. has agreed to basically back Israel's invasion of Rafah if they don't respond to Iran's retaliation for the Israeli attack on the embassy in Damascus. Um, I know it's all speculation, but does it seem plausible to you that the U.S. and Iran could make that, uh, sorry, that the U.S. and Israel could make that trade? First of all, we should say that uh, I saw a clip of Biden saying Haifa, not Rafa. So he's confused about the two places. The yeah. second thing is, to be clear and accurate, the United States never said that they oppose an invasion of Rafa. Mm -hmm. They always said, if we agree on a plan that can take care of this, as if there could be such a plan. I mean, those two are contradictory. I mean, it's like, uh, anyway, uh, they want a plan whereby they can invade Rafah of 1.7 million people and yet take care of the civilian population, something you cannot, you, you cannot, you, you cannot do. And uh, what they are saying now is something they've said before, but now it is being peddled as a trade-off uh, so that Israel does not, at, I mean, notice that Israel is always retaliating. Arabs never retaliate. Like, for example, even during the day of Saddam Hussein, I remember, Saddam Hussein would say, if we are attacked by Israel, we're going to attack Israel. The next day, all American people would say, Saddam threatens attacking Israel. Same thing now. It is now Iran attacked Israel when it was merely a justifiable military retaliation that avoiding hitting the civilian target. Look at the words happening in South Lebanon between Hezbollah and uh, and Israel, Hezbollah has targeted the military. They were very clear about that and they made it in writing. The Israelis, of course, they never care because they have no value of Arab lives. It is a fundamentally racist ideology. It's like, how do you justify slavery if you don't believe that the people there are inferior to you? The same thing for Zionism. You cannot justify ethnic cleansing, expulsion of the population, subjugating them, if you don't sincerely believe that they are inferior. And that's why Zionists of the United States and the West in general can easily accept the slaughter of thousands, tens of thousands of Palestinians and Arabs because they are seen as inferior people. They don't amount to the same. I mean, this is why when a plane crash in Africa doesn't get the same attention of one in Israel or in uh, Australia. As we're recording this, the U.S. is vetoing a U.N. Security Council proposal uh, for Palestinian statehood, uh, the latest effort by Palestine's representatives at the UN to just get the um, nominal rights of statehood, uh, which the US has always blocked. And at the State Department, uh, spokesperson Vedant Patel was just asked about this, and this is what he said. The United States uh, is voting no on this uh, proposed Security Council resolution. Okay. As an yeah, expert of the UN, the I, will also, I will also just so note um, that due to statutory requirements, such um, an admission of statehood would also require the United States to cease its funding to the United Nations. Um, but uh, the U.S. is committed to intensifying its engagement on this issues with the Palestinians and the rest of the region, not only to address the current crisis in Gaza, uh, but to advance a political settlement here that we think 
can create a path to Palestinian statehood and membership in the United Nations. All right, and then uh, you said the most, you believe, the U.S. believes that the most expeditious way to statehood is through direct negotiations. So just to make sure, I just kind of, I just Googled expeditious. Marked by or acting with prompt efficiency. How many years has it been since Oslo? It's Isn't been, the most expeditious way to Palestinian statehood to have a to have some kind of a, 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 a an announcement or a, a or a determination um, by the UN? Unless you're not, unless we don't you don't really so. mean expeditious because expeditions means fast. We do mean uh, expeditious, and we do uh, not believe that the uh, pathway through New York and the United Nations is the best path forward. And as I so noted, uh, such action through the United Nations would statutorily require the United States to cease its funding to the UN. That's the great Matt Lee of the AP asking those questions. Right, 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 right. Uh, although he's always keen to say, I'm not pro-Palestinian, so right. please let's mention that. Yeah. He always wants people to know that. Yes, you're not pro-Palestinian. We got that. Uh, I want to say about that statement. First, I think that, as you said, Matt, uh, Aaron, has said, uh, it is meaningless. It is entirely meaningless to announce declaration of Palestinian state. It's like, yes, Arafat 1988 declared the state of Palestine. I mean, these are verbal declaration. The Palestinian state can only be declared by the effort of the Palestinian people on the ground. And obviously, like all struggles of people in developing countries, it can be one, uh, not through uh, musical instruments of resistance. Uh, and the Palestinian people are not exceptionists, especially when they are facing such a brutal, savage enemy like Israel. And Israel clearly is a party to which the slogan it used against Palestinians applies to it, that the only language it understands is the language of force. The Palestinians tried all other methods. From 1948 until the 60s, they tried peaceful resistance and it went them nowhere. They, threw, they used to go to cross the border to check on their lands and properties. And they used to be shot like pigeons. Even Benny Morris in his book admits that, among other historians. Also, I always mention the case of Mubarak Awad. Here is, and I knew the man in Washington, very naive man. He's a Quaker, Palestinian, Mubarak Awad. In 1985, he said, I believe in nonviolent struggle. Okay. And I used to make fun of him all the time. He went to Jerusalem, established a center for nonviolence, and he preached nonviolence to the Palestinians. What happened to Mubarak Awad? His center was closed down and he was kicked out of the country by Israel on charges of terrorism. So you cannot lecture to the Palestinians about which method they find appropriate for their struggle. The declaration of Palestine, in my opinion, is a distraction of the Palestinian question. This is an attempt to give more legitimacy to the corrupt criminal collaborationist team in Ramallah of the Palestinian Authority, which has to be dealt with exactly like the South Lebanon army in South Lebanon. This is an appendage of the occupation. It is funded by Gulf governments and the Western government in order to repress the Palestinian. The 94 strong security forces are intended not to protect the Palestinian, but to crack down, to prevent them from expressing their rage against Israelis and to prevent them from resisting Israelis. And of course, they are, an, they are agents. They spy on the Palestinian and give information to the Israelis to come and arrest and kill Palestinians. So I think the declaration will happen after a process of struggle by the Palestinian and not before. Western countries, Spain included and others, want to uh, deceive the Palestinians to say that we are willing to support a verbal declaration, admission to United Nations, which is not gonna make any difference. I mean, United Nations is run by the will of the United States. And I take it as seriously as I take the International Criminal uh, Court of Justice uh, which can be called criminal because it basically made an announcement about genocide that it's impossible to look into genocide without doing anything about it. Not that I expected anything. We remember when the ICJ ruled against the United States in the mining of Nicaraguan uh, harbors and you know the United States uh, just ignored it. I mean, look how many decisions by the United States, uh, by the United Nations were ignored by Israel and by the United States. Can you give us your assessment of uh, Hezbollah's handling uh, of this crisis since October 7th? And do you think Israel wants to fight Hezbollah directly? Uh, or do you think they want to try to draw in the U.S. to do that? What do you think about the dynamic between Israel and, and, and Hezbollah? Israel does not want to expand the war. Of that, I am certain. If Israel can expand the war, it would have done so. If Israel can defeat Hezbollah, it would have done so a long time ago. 
I have taken so many bets with people in the West and in Lebanon since 2006 about whether Israel is going to attack Lebanon next summer. And I have been consistent that it will not do that because Israel tried for 33 days to smash Hezbollah and they were humiliated on the battlefield, could not advance one inch into Lebanese territory. This is a group that is not like the PLO, which Israel faced before. Israel used to come from South Lebanon to the bo- from the border with Palestine into Beirut within hours. It smashed three Arab armies in 1967 in a matter of hours, uh, days, but even hours. Uh, Hezbollah is a different story. They have been in fighting since October and Israel has not made any achievement. Yes, they have killed some of the fighters of Hezbollah and Israel has killed Israelis. I mean, the ratio, of course, is in favor of Israel because they have the air force. But what Hezbollah does not want to expand the war either because Lebanon is totally economically debilitated. The people are very fatigued and exhausted and there is no much appetite for a larger war given how Israel fights wars and destroying airports and air power stations and so on. Uh, But the people of South Lebanon, however, from whom I hail, are determined to resist Israeli aggression. And they are showing it clearly. You don't see any signs whatsoever of diminution in their will to fight Israel. Look at Gaza, by the way. Can you believe the people of Gaza, what they are going through? And after more than six months, you don't see one demonstration against Hamas? Israel was calculating on that. Saudi Arabia and its media was banking on that, that they would come out and they demonstrate against Hamas. The people really know their priorities and they know this is an enemy cannot be won over except through uh, resistance, armed resistance. And Hezbollah has done that. And the military power of Hezbollah has expanded since 2006. And for that reason, there's not going to be war. So the two sides don't want war. America doesn't want war either because it doesn't guarantee that Israel can win. And this is another revelation about Israel. Over the years, since I was a boy, I remember that the Israeli lobby justified funding of Israel and people in Congress said, we're going to give them all these billions of dollars a year because so that we don't have to fight over there, that Israel fights on behalf of U.S. interests, that they can take care of their own. And you know how many times Netanyahu said, Israel can take care of its own defense. They don't need extra help. Well, they do. I mean, if from October 7, the United States did not militarily and Germany and Britain and all these countries intervene to supply Israel with arms and so on, Israel would have been defeated. You realize that? Israel would have definitely been defeated from two borders. Uh, But the United States now doesn't trust Israel even. Look how they rushed along with Germany and France and England in order to uh, support Israel and defend it from missiles and drones. Israel cannot do it on its own. And even in Lebanon, the United States on October 7 immediately moved its fleet because they were afraid that Hezbollah was going to attack Israel with all its force. So the United States is now realizing, or it should realize, or the people of the United States should realize, Israel has become a burden, a defense burden. All the billions we spend on them, and yet they can't defend themselves. So why should we give them any weapons? Let the United States station, uh, create military bases inside Israel, and the U.S. can defend Israel from its enemies. Let's go to a few clips from this congressional hearing. It is so chilling what is going on, but at the same time, you can't help but find it comical because it's it's so ridiculous. So uh, in this first clip, this is Congress member Lisa McLean uh, admonishing the president of Colombia to condemn what she calls the enfantada. <laughs> and to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiotspodcast.com. Well, very grateful to Professor Asad Abul Khalil for joining us. That was very informative and really appreciate his time. Yeah, what a great interview. He knows so much about so much. And you as an audience must know a lot because you're tuning in to this very informative and irreverent podcast. And we thank you for it. Thank you for supporting the show. Remember to go to usefulidiotspodcast.com to get bonus content and keep the show going. Including Thursday Throwdown, your midweek dose of media madness, and an extended interview with our guests. And it's great. We talk about uh, the presidential elections, whether uh, the priority should be getting uh, Biden reelected or uh, getting him not elected. And before we go, I wanted to do another edition of Useful Idiots Kids Book Corner. 
If you follow the show, you know that friend of the show, Karina Gonzalez, uh, had a award-winning book called The Cokie Still Sing that came out a few years ago, which we ha- featured on the show. Katie, you interviewed her on your show. I did. I her on the Katie Helper show, yeah. She has a new book, which just dropped, and it's a tribute to immigrant street vendors, and it's very touching, and it's just come out this week, which is very exciting. Here is the book cover. It's called Chudo Stand. It's a lovely book. It's out now, available in all book stores. And if you're in New York City, there's even a display in the front of the store, Books of Wonder. So go by and check that out to uh, see what's happening with, with Churro Stand. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for watching and listening and stopping by as always. And we will see you next week. Now I'm hungry for churros. <laughs> and happy birthday to my mother, Nora Eisenberg. Happy birthday, Nora. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For extended episodes, bonus content, and our weekly Thursday Throwdown episode, please subscribe at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. Support the show for free by subscribing on YouTube, Rumble, and wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate and review. You can also follow us on Twitter at UsefulIdiotPod. Thanks for supporting independent media. We'll see you next time.